So I've got Kevin Pelton here to discuss what's been sort of a saga in the WNBA. We're going to be talking about Gabby Williams, Maureen Johannes, and what has been the latest when it comes to WNBA prioritization. The Locked On Women's Basketball Podcast. It starts right now. Ogumba Wallet for the win. You are Locked On Women's Basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. Hello and welcome. You are locked on to women's basketball. I'm Jackie Powell. I'm one of your Friday hosts. I cover the New York Liberty here at the Next and I help out with our social media strategy. I've also covered women's basketball nationally at many other places. We want to thank you for making Locked on Women's Basketball your first listen every day. And remember that Locked on Women's Basketball is brought to you by everyone at The Next, a place where we cover women's basketball all the time, and we tell the stories that need to be told every day. If you subscribe now, you can get 27% off our typical price in honor of the WNBA's 27th season, Uh, $52.56 for a year instead of $72 per year. Also, Locked on Women's Basketball is free and available on all platforms, including YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and many more. This show and this episode is brought to you by GameTime. Download the GameTime app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONNBA for $20 off your first purchase. Last-minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. All right, so the last time we were together, listener, I had Isabel Rodriguez on the pod, and we revealed our preseason WNBA power rankings. But today, the show is completely different. But that is not, that is an exciting thing, to be quite honest. So here I have ESPN.com's Kevin Pelton, and we're going to be talking about this storyline that both he and I have been following quite closely for the past couple of weeks. So just to give you all a sense of our roadmap here, first we're going to be unpacking the entire Gabby Williams saga report by report, because there's been just a lot that's gone on. Then we're going to more talk about what's going on with the French Federation when it comes to Gabby Williams and Maureen Johannes, who is obviously a member of the New York Liberty. And then finally, we're going to sort of reflect on what we've learned from WNBA prioritization and sort of what, what these situations teach us about WNBA prioritization. So anyway, Kevin, thank you so much for being here. I think where I want to start with you is... Let's start at the beginning when it comes to Gabby Williams and prioritization. What has been her stance on this? Yeah, it was something that we knew was a potential issue when she agreed to sign with Osvel last summer and to play in France and started to see, you know, some dates for when those finals might be and that they pretty clearly were going to be after the start of the WNBA regular season, which was the deadline this year for prioritization. So at her exit interview at the end of the storm season last September, you know, she said that she was uncertain whether she was going to be able to play in the WNBA and expressed her frustration with the role as someone who, you know, has has prioritized playing overseas, uh, you know, because of the fact that she's been well compensated for it. And it's also is part of the French national team. I think something that's very important to her. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we sort of, I remember she very much so in that um, those exit interviews put the WNBA on blast, which I thought was very striking. Um, And, so there was sort of this assumption that, okay, just like Emma Mieseman, that Gabby Williams probably was not going to come over to the WNBA this season. So I think what I want to ask you is when exactly did things start to get confusing based on your reporting? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I probably took it too much for granted that 
number one, Osvell was going to be in the finals. And number, you know, that was going to rule out Gabby Williams. Uh, but one thing that happened, I guess, if we go back to free agency, like if things had played out differently, if Brianna Stewart had resigned with the Storm and they had signed Courtney Vanderson, let's say you're in that world, like it's possible they might have had to renounce Gabby Williams' rights as a restricted free agent because of the cap hold that she has on their books. But because of the fact that, you know, they ended up kind of pivoting to more of a youth based direction didn't sign many high-priced free agents. They had the cap space to maintain that that restricted hold and then still have the most cap space in the league by far. So they had the room, if things worked out, to bring Gabby Williams in this season. And I guess I didn't really start taking it seriously until uh, their media day availability was, I want to say, May 9th. Maybe that was the preseason game. It was somewhere in, in that week. And Osvell had already lost the first game of their semifinal series on the road by 13, a, a two-game aggregate. So, you know, there was all of a sudden was some jeopardy of whether they were going to make it to the finals. And had they been eliminated in the semifinals, this would have been easy. It would have been no question that Gabby Williams was eligible to play in the league this year. Uh, she would have signed. Uh, you know, I she presumably would have signed with the Storm. They, they were very confident in that. But the other complicating factor was that in game one of that semifinal series that she suffered a concussion that, uh, you know, continues to affect her. Yeah, I mean, what's... Wow. Um, and I think for our listeners, just to make sure they remember... So in the we're in the first year of prioritization. And so what that means is if you... You can miss training camp. You will be fined, but you can miss all of training camp. And as long as you are there for the start of the regular season. That was at least what we thought, right? Key key distinction here because of the way that the rule is written. Mm Mm-hmm. So explain, I guess, where I want to go next is what sort of loophole did the storm find here? And why are we sort of in this in-between place where I believe it was, it was Michael Vopel who reported this, that Gabby Williams is not completely sure yet if she's going to play in the WNBA, but she can if she wants to. Right. Yeah. And I, and I think that largely relates to the concussion and, and the after effects of that. It's her second in the last nine months here. She suffered one in the quarterfinals of the WNBA playoffs last year, missed mm-hmm. the first two games of the Storm semifinal series against the Aces before returning for the last two of that. So it's certainly scary to have, you know, two concussions in such a short period of time in less than a year. But uh, so I think that that gets to her uncertainty about whether to play this season. But so the 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 loophole so to speak here because one of the things that came up originally you know brianna stewart last year signed a one-year deal with the storm attributed that to the uncertainty over prioritization and that sent everyone you know scrambling to figure out well wait if you're a free agent does that mean the rules don't apply to you and they still still do apply but there is one technical difference if you're under contract you had to be in market with your team by the start of the regular season is a free agent, Gabby Williams merely had to have completed her off-season services by the start of the WNBA regular season last Friday. And so that created the opportunity for the her contract to be suspended after she played in game one of the French finals, but still didn't feel right. It, it seems very clear now that she would have been unable to play in games two or three of that series anyway. So Osvell wasn't really losing her services by suspending that contract but it created the benefit of making her eligible for the WNBA this season. I just, it's just wild. Like it's absolutely wild. And I think the thing is that, again, I I, I bring up the Emma Mieseman situation, how during free agency, you know, a lot of people asked around, so what's Emma doing? And I think it was very clear amongst us WNBA media folks that she wasn't coming. She just wasn't coming. And, but this was, this is completely different. And so I just wonder why. We might not have enough information to know why, but I'm curious what you think. Yeah, I mean, I think the, for Gabby, it was never a case of, 
you know, being so upset about the prioritization rules that she was unwilling to come back to the WNBA. It was just a question of whether she was going to be eligible. And that uncertainty, I think, is is what kind of lingered for a period of time, again, up until that concussion, which kind of presumably changed things from her perspective. Right, right. Wow. I mean, I'm just sort of thinking what would have happened if she didn't have the concussion? I mean, we'll never know but it almost seems like to me that this this plan was sort of in motion for a while and it just sort of surprised us all i think i think her priority in that case and we're using this word correctly in the context of prioritization would have been to play in the rest of the french finals and it, we would have had clarity then that she would have been ineligible to play in the wnba mm, interesting interesting So I think the last thing I want to get into before we take a quick break is what might the Storm have to do when it comes to their roster if she does, in fact, come over after she's recovered from the concussion? Yeah, it it sort of depends on what salary she and the Storm are eventually able to negotiate. But you know, based on sort of their understanding, one of the things that that they told us throughout training camp is if she comes, we'd only be able to keep a roster of 11 players Mm -hmm. as opposed to the full 12 player roster that they currently have. Now, you know, a couple of things have changed since then. One thing is uh, in their final cuts, uh, Teresa Plaisance was was their last cut, and she was someone who was making a bit more than the players in their first three years of experience on the minimum who ended up filling out the roster. So that might create a situation where they can keep 12. It might be a situation where they have to go a period of time, uh, a, a short period of time with 11, but then the rest of season contract becomes small enough as that pro rates over the course of this season that they could then add a 12th player pretty quickly. But at the very least, they would have to waive someone from the the current roster if Gabby decides to resign. Hmm. Wow. That's a lot of cap uh, gymnastics, I must say. But to be quite honest, if we're talking about the WNBA in general, to be managing a team well in this league, you have to be willing to engage in all of the, the gymnastics possible because of what happens when players are injured, the fact that there isn't an injured reserve, the fact that roster sizes are so limited. I could go on and on and on. <laughs> but okay, so before we get into our second segment, which we're going to talk about the drama that has gone on when it comes to the French national team and how that sort of relates to what we're talking about here. But first, I want to introduce you all to an app called Game Time. And so I am a Lady Gaga stan and a pop culture connoisseur, and Kevin knows that. I spent a whole dinner with Kevin talking about it. But anyway, so you all could imagine how much of a struggle it is to deal with the cues on Ticketmaster in order to get tickets. Buying tickets to enjoy a concert or even a WNBA game shouldn't be this stressful. Game time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all of the sports, music, comedy, and theater near you with killer deals on last minute tickets and their best price guarantee you can stop stressing over getting the tickets and being in that queue and start getting pumped for the fun that you were about to have get images of your seat before you buy so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive buy tickets in a matter of seconds two taps and you are all set Tickets are sent directly to your phone, so you never have to dig through your email. Download the GameTime app, create an account, and use the code LOCKEDONNBA for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. And again, create an account and redeem code LOCKEDONNBA and get $20 off. Download GameTime today. Last-minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. All right, so let us get back to our program and dive into segment two. So, why are both Gabby Williams and Maureen Johannes not playing in Eurobasket? 
We answered part of that question in segment one, which is Gabby Williams has a concussion. And so medically she is ruled out. Um, But the very complex part of this is the Marine Johannes part. And (laughs) when we talk about sagas, I mean, the whole storyline for both of these players has just been absolutely wild. It's been back and forth and back and forth. And so when it comes to Marine, I'd say that the craziness started maybe in March when she signed with the Liberty. Because it was sort of like, okay, when are they going to expect her? Are they going to expect her after Eurobasket? What is going on? That wasn't very clear. Like, you have um, Eliana Rupert, right? The Dream expect Eliana Rupert to be with them, I want to say, after Eurobasket. And the Dream are fine with that. Obviously, Eliana Rupert is a young player right? So prioritization does not apply to her. But prioritization also does not apply to Marine Johannes. So what's really interesting is, and I'm just curious what you think about the contrasting situations. You know, obviously we know that Marine does not apply to prioritization yet, but what do you think has led to sort of this this different road in addition to that fact? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the interesting questions is how much priority there is on, we keep going back to that, on Eurobasket in particular for France this year. Because, you know, as you, if you compare France to some of these other countries, you've mentioned Emma Mason in, in Belgium. This is a much bigger deal for them because... Eurobasket is also the qualifier for the 2024 Women's Olympics. Because of the fact that they're in Paris, France is the host, they're automatically qualified. So it's still certainly a big deal as the Continental Championships, but maybe not as important to them as some of these other countries. Which is what makes this whole situation wild. And which is what makes the fact that the French Federation, and I can report that Marine Johannes and the French Federation have been in talks for months about this. She has made it clear that one of her priorities is to play on the New York Liberty super team. That is very appealing to her. And I would understand why. I mean, I'm sure other international players would want to play on a team like that. So it's just, you bring up such a great point. The fact that Does France really need this? I mean, the thing that I think about is I think of Basketball Australia, right? Where they are competing in the Asia Cup, right? In Is that in July or is it late June? I think it's... Anyway, Asia Cup is happening. Australia is partaking, as is China. And you look at Basketball Australia's roster list. No WNBA players. None of them. You've got a lot of the younger players in their system that are playing in this. And it just, it just begs the question, why, why doesn't that type of thing happen in France? Yeah, I feel like probably a couple of reasons. Number one, obviously the depth of competition in the, the Asia FIBA pool is not as strong as in Europe for uh, not only just the kind of talent that those countries are producing, but also in Europe, we see a lot more of these WNBA stars who are naturalized as citizens, uh, which has the benefit of allowing them to not count as import players in EuroLeague and some of the domestic leagues don't really have that same advantage in Asia because they don't have the same kind of you know domestic intercontinental or intercontinental cup that Europe does. And then I think the other element it is like the WNBA and Australia have always seemed more closely tied. Obviously, the coach of the Australian national team is Sandy Brundello, the coach of the Liberty. She's here. <laughs> She's not going to be part of that Asia FIBA Asia Cup, presumably either. Uh, and you know, it's always been like important for them to have their players in the WNBA to get that kind of competition. Also, possibly 
because of the fact that like if you're in the domestic league in France and playing in uh, Euro Cup or Euro League, you're competing at kind of a higher level of competition than if you're playing in the NBL in Australia, uh, which just you know doesn't have again that continental aspect to it. So you know, I think for all of those reasons, Australia has always been much more WNBA friendly than many of the European federations have been. Yeah. Oh man. Um, you know, it's, it, it's interesting because then when you think about the Chinese Federation, the fact that you have, so there are two Chinese players in the league this year. I mean, it's, um, it's Han Shu and Li Meng. And it's really interesting because there were, there were some others. I think the Los Angeles Sparks had, um, who did they have? Um, the point guard. Was it Yang Liwei? I think they had her and they waived her. And then obviously uh, Li Yuru had this freak injury or, or whatever this is. And so it's just, it's interesting that there isn't this tension. There isn't this issue with at least those two players that are still in the league. There's an understanding that the Mystics and the Liberty are going to have to temporarily suspend Han and Lee, and then they'll come back when they're done. And it seems like there's no problem. And so it's just, I mean, I just wonder also, is the French Federation, maybe there hasn't been a history of the, of France. Well, actually, I mean, there's been um, Edwidge uh, Lawson, but has there been anyone besides her who has really been you know, a key part of the WNBA. Sandrine Gruda for a period of time. Ah, uh, yes, yes. But then, I mean, we haven't seen her in the league in a right. while. So I just wonder, it's like there is a lot of talent in France. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it seems like there is a lot of talent in France that wants to play in the WNBA. I mean, when you look at someone like Eliana Ruper. Part of the reason, my understanding, the reason why Vegas waived her was because she wanted more of an opportunity to develop and she wants to be in the WNBA. It also made sense that, you know, the general manager who drafted her was able to pick her up off waivers. But maybe that's part of what's going on. It's like there is a lot of talent coming from France and the Federation is having to get used to this. Yeah, it's a challenge to manage. And I think the other thing we see is it's it's not necessarily the same for every individual player. Like different players have different goals and and again, priorities. Absolutely. I mean, the thing about Maureen Johannes is that she has it's clear that her priority is to play in the WNBA. That is something she wants to do. And it's really interesting because I saw there were some tweets out there. And I think actually there was a quote from um, Nicholas uh, Bantam. I don't know if I, or I'm Nic not Nic saying. Nicola Batum. Thank you. Thank you. I am embarrassed, but thank God I'm not the only person on this podcast. But he said something along the lines of that Marine has been playing for the Federation for, I mean, maybe since she was 15 years old and she's sort of done everything that they have asked her to do since she was a teenager. So it's just, it, it's, it's really fascinating um, that, you know, at 28 years old now, she's sort of like, well, I have the leverage to go play in the WNBA. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. So um, in our next segment, we're going to talk about just that. We're going to talk about sort of player empowerment, prioritization, what we're noticing when it comes to how prioritization is affecting the WNBA. But first, I would like to tell you all about bird dogs. And yes, it is, it is an interesting name, bird dogs. But if you are looking for the perfect Father's Day gift, it's coming up in less than a month. And if you are scrambling, 
Bird dogs are the perfect gift for your dad, grandfather, uncle to make their special day even better. So bird dogs are pants, shorts, and even bathing suits with so much versatility in their fit, but also they're just very comfortable. Their stretchy fabric makes your legs look great. And according to my editor, Howard Megdahl, they are much more comfy than, uh, than any other shorts or pants. What's brilliant about bird dogs is that they can be worn almost anywhere. They're versatile. You wear them when you're just hanging out, at a meeting, or even on a date. So with Father's Day coming up, go to birddogs.com slash LockedOnNBA and enter the promo code LockedOnNBA. We'll throw in a free custom Bird Dogs Yeti style tumbler with every order. All right, we are back. Kevin, I'm going to pose this question to you and we're going to see where the conversation goes. What have we learned about WNBA prioritization in its first year? Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, you mentioned following this, these stories closely over the last couple of weeks. I feel like this really dates back to, it's been a primary topic since February, 2022, which was when Brianna Stewart started speaking up with this in conjunction with her resigning with the storm and kind of flagging it is something that was a major concern for her going forward and her availability in the league. And this year, that kind of ended up being much ado about nothing because if Gabby now that Gabby Williams is eligible, there are no players who ended the season on rosters who have been ruled out by the prioritization rule. There are a few who were unsigned who have played in the league in the recent past. Uh, Kennedy Burke was one of the opponents for Osvell in the uh, in the finals in France. Her teammate Brooke Dietrich. Uh, there's a couple others who have played in. I, I think Sandrine Gruda was on that roster as well. Mm-hmm. Yep, Blake Dietrich. Mm-hmm if they wanted to play in the league this year would not be able to because of the rule, but it wasn't necessarily their plan anyway, but the WNBA can't get lulled into a full sense of security here because what's coming next year is this is kind of the transition year of the priority prioritization rule is we talked about the deadline was beginning of the regular season. Next year, the deadline is going to be the beginning of training camp or May 1st, which is ever those is later, which will almost certainly be May 1st. You layer on top of that, it's an Olympic year. So the WNBA season is going to have to expand on either end to make up for the fact that you're taking a month off in between. And that means, you know, training camps probably will be starting earlier than May 1st. So now the question becomes, you know, the the reason this worked out is because some of the leagues, uh, many of the leagues managed to change their schedules to fit around the WNBA's timetable. Now that that's an earlier deadline for them, will they be that flexible? That's that's a, the million dollar question, I suppose. I also happen to believe, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that a reason why a lot of the European leagues, including the Turkish league, why they were able to adjust or why they thought it was a good idea or prudent idea was because of Eurobasket. Because you had all of these national teams that were like, oh, yep, we're going to start our training at X, Y, Z time. And you can't still be in season when we want to start that training. So in a year without Eurobasket, is FIBA going to compromise? Like, I really don't know. I, I don't, there is not a lot out there about what types of discussions have the WNBA had with FIBA, in addition to some of these domestic leagues. How is all of this going to work? Who is going to be the first actor in this group of actors that decides to, I don't want to say fold, but I guess come to some sort of compromise? Yeah, and certainly like it doesn't seem like there's any movement coming from the WNBA. I mean, this is something that I asked Commissioner Kathy Engelbert about at last year's kind of state of the league address at the WNBA finals. Like, you know, are you comfortable with the possibility that you could lose some of the league's biggest stars to the rule? And, you know, there was no indication of backing down. And, you know, I'm I'm paraphrasing because this was nine months ago, but it was basically we went into this with eyes wide open as to what the possibilities were. Now, those players are the other group with power in this situation. You know, if 
if it remain if they want to continue playing overseas but also still want to be able to play in the WNBA under the prioritization rule they i think a factor is them going to the leagues and requesting the ability to you know wrap up early enough for them to play in the WNBA as well and that can be sort of a a competitive advantage i think for leagues that are willing to do it yeah oh yeah but the point is you know, th- there has to be a discussion that happens. I mean, we just don't know a-, a lot about it. And so I think where I wanna move our discussion to is what I find so fascinating about, or actually before I discuss Maureen Johannes's player empowerment, I think the one thing I wanna touch on also is I just wonder how many injuries have occurred in training camp slash the beginning of the WNBA season in comparison to others. I mean, that's a number I don't have on the top of, off the top of my head, but I just wonder this whole concept of having players in market, at least during training camp, I wonder the benefits that that's had on coaches, teams, performance staff. Yeah. I mean, certainly you, you talk to coaches and it was in, in experience they're not used to. Like in the Storm's case, uh, you know, not counting Gabby Williams, who was unsigned, <laughs> they had 15 of their 16 players were in training camp from day one. Ivana Doikic was the only one who was late, arrived midway through training camp. And typically you're starting training camp with, you know, maybe half your actual roster is there. And, you know, about half of the players you have are, are players who you know are undrafted rookies, players who you know you, you're pretty confident are not going to actually make the team, but you need those numbers at the start of training camp. And that is an interesting side effect: is not as many players got the chance to participate in training camp this year because usually it was you know it's uh, 15 active at any given time, but up to 20 on the roster period, and, and teams would take full advantage of that. Uh, one of the things I looked at a couple of years ago is like is there a statistical effect at the start of the season of players coming in late? And it was tough to find beyond the opening game much statistically, but certainly it doesn't seem like there can be any downside to having your whole roster together for training camp from a basketball standpoint, or like you said, from a marketing standpoint to be out, you know, making appearances to be on local TV shows, things like that. I also just think there's a lot of chaos that we don't really know about when it comes to, when players show up late and just that whole process. If you're coming in during the season, in the middle of the season, games are not just going to stop. You know, business as usual continues. And I think that's, I think that leads me back to Maureen Johannes because she made a very, I guess, conscious decision of, I want to go to New York so I can catch my breath get settled in and not be in this state of chaos, which she, you know, miraculously dealt with a year ago when she came in in the beginning of June, she sort of said to herself, hey, if I can do something to avoid that, do something where I come in while the team is just practicing instead of playing games, it's it's fascinating. And I think it also it reminds us of prioritization in a different light, which is could prioritization be working? I don't know if I want to say in the reverse, but in the W's favor in that Maureen Johannes, an international player decided that she wanted to prioritize the WNBA. That is something that people thought would never happen. (laughs) Yeah, I think, and and I think we're going to continue to see it evolve over time. I mean, this was one of the things I talked a lot about last year with Sue Bird, who is part of the negotiating committee on the CBA, and you know has a, a perspective on basically all of WNBA history, having come into the league in two thousand two. <laughs> and one of the things she observed on the American side is, you know, that long term she wasn't sure it was going to be an issue because so many player younger players are coming in and aren't interested in going overseas anyways because of the fact that they're coming in with 
uh, much greater sponsorship opportunities, NIL deals coming out of college, things like that. But also on the international side, you know, the more the WNBA is established, I think is the premier kind of home for women's basketball, the more important it's going to be for players to show their talents there. And, and maybe even if that costs them at times some opportunities with the national team. I mean, absolutely. And I also think it may be, it's about the organization that you're playing for. I think in the case of the Liberty and the Storm, there are benefits that attract these, you know, very talented international players. I mean, both arenas are beautiful. Um, We all know Joe and Clara Wusai's stance on player performance. In the Storm's case, they're working on this beautiful facility. So... It's interesting that it's rather coming together on a team to team basis rather than just the league in general. And I just wonder when all of the teams within the league are able to provide the amenities that the Storm and the Liberty are, will that make prioritization less of a talking point? I think so. Yeah. I mean, look, this is all part of this really complex web of the WNBA's growth from what it has been over the first 25 plus years of its existence to what it is in the process of becoming. And a lot of that is taking care of the players better than they have been in the past. And, you know, I think the hope is eventually you get salaries to the point where players don't feel like they need to play overseas in the off season from a financial standpoint. Now, that's not the only reason they do it. Uh, ben Pickman at The Athletic did a great job in his coverage this off season of highlighting, you know, the cultural benefits, things like that, that players enjoy when they're overseas. But, you know, I don't, for the most part, I, I think that's kind of happening because you start doing it from a financial perspective and then you discover those other benefits along the way. So is is we get the WNBA to the place where, like the NBA, you know, it's seen as kind of the pinnacle of basketball competition. I, I think those choices become a lot easier for people. Like, you know, you think of we we talked about Tony Parker is the over owner of Osvell, Nicola Batum, uh, who weighed on in on this. There was never any question of like, are they going to stay in France and play domestically there? Are they going to go to the NBA? The NBA was always clearly the goal. The W it's been a little different because you've had the ability to do both. But if you get the WNBA to that point, then a lot of these questions go away. That's a fascinating point because I remember when Brianna Stewart and Courtney Vandersloot were introduced as part of the New York Liberty, there was some discussion about making this league global, something that Sandy Brondello was saying. And when Sandy Brondello said it, Brianna Stewart was like bobbing her head up and down. And it was something that made her really excited. And so it seems like that's the direction that the WNBA wants to be going in. And something that we don't know the answer to now, but I think is just a great question to leave all of you on, is the fact that Tony Parker was willing to, um, I guess, cut ties with Gabby Williams' contract before the end of that championship series. I thought it was fascinating because he seems to understand what's at stake in the WNBA. Absolutely. And I mean, this is somebody who has the perspective of having been a player, having supported women's sports. He's he's also, uh, I know here in Seattle, a part owner of the OL Ray and the uh, NWSL franchise, uh, dating back to their official affiliation with Olympic Lyon. So, you know, I, he's got that perspective and I think helped him understand, look, also Gabby was, again, as we've talked about, not going to be able to play in games two and three of that series. They weren't giving up anything, but, you know, I think it's uh, one of those gestures that helps maintain a strong relationship with players. And you kind of need to see that on both sides from WNBA owners and from, from owners elsewhere. And even the national team federations too. Yep. yep. That, that needs to happen. Anyway, thank you for making Locked on Women's Basketball your first listen every day. 
And I want to give a huge thank you and shout out to Kevin for joining the show. You can follow him at K Pelton WBB. And remember, join us for tomorrow's episode. Yes, we are on six days a week when our scouting crew of Hunter Cruz, M. Adler, and Lincoln Schaefer will be examining how the WNBA rookies and sophomores have done during this early go at the 27th season. I'm Jackie Powell, alongside Kevin Pelton, and we hope you enjoy your weekend. Welcome to Wallet. For the win! You are Locked On Women's Basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball.